uh, this will be available on our website uh, later today. So with that, Paul, let's go ahead and get started. All right. Good morning, everyone. And uh, welcome to our uh, Spokeshave SIG. Got a couple little stories to tell you first. Um, I, my wife and I, you know, we've all had a lot of time on our hands. So we put on gloves and masks and went around our neighborhood's uh, little libraries recently. And I found a book about the search for the Northwest Passage. This is furniture related. <laughs> Um, and it, it, was, it was when in the 1850s when Britain was at the height of its empire and arrogance and they were trying to find their way from, from, from the Atlantic to the Pacific above Canada, um, which was uh, to this day still hasn't been successfully, uh, su successfully done for a shipping link. Anyway, the, the, the upshot was that a lot of people, a lot of ships got abandoned, a lot of people died. Um, and a lot of money and time and, and ships were wasted trying to find a couple of ships. One of them was known as the Resolute, and she was abandoned by, a, she was a Royal Navy ship, abandoned uh, way up in the ice um, north of Canada, um, and was found by an American whaling ship a year later, um, floating on the water, still seaworthy and she was taken back to america where the american government were persuaded to refurbish this boat and give it back to um to her, to her majesty uh, queen victoria anyway when that boat was you know it was very much appreciated it was a huge gesture of friendship between england and, and america because the salvage rights would be the when that ship was scrapped she was um she were, the finest timbers from that ship were taken and they were made into a large desk which was given to the American government. And that desk sits in the White House today. It's known as the Resolute Desk. We hear it on, about it on TV. Anyway, the name of the book is The Resolute. And uh, I just thought it was an interesting little furniture story that ties my country and, and you guys' country together. And. Uh, and, you know, I've only recently heard about this desk, you know, because they mentioned it so much in, on the media recently. But anyway, moving on, we had some uh, uh, requests about, or not requests, uh, inquiries about, uh, about rust proofing. So I thought I'd bring in what I use. I, what I do is I use camellia oil. If you look real, real close there, you can see the instructions. I'm sure you can all read them clearly. And um, anyway, what you do is you soak the camellia oil in old t-shirt material or something of that nature. And if you want, I keep it in an old, you know, just an old Advil container. Um, I pull them out and I just, you know, I'll just wipe, wipe my blades with them. And that oil hardens up a little bit and uh, gives you some protection against rust. You can also keep them in a sock, literally a sock if you want, but this is a, you know, Lee Nielsen sock, my new toy. <laughs> mm -hmm. And um, so those are a couple of ways. Keeping them in cabinets is good. But I just thought I'd show you the camellia oil. I will later on um, put up a, um, a local place that you can buy it at. Um, there's a couple of places, actually. You can, you can buy it at Rockler and TH&H. &H. I think it's better value at TH&H. &H. One of these bottles is about $23. But that's... I've been woodworking for eight years, and that's what I've used. Um, so that's, that's the uh, rust resistance presentation. Um, spoke shapes. Spoke shapes are really just an adaptation of the plane. They're kind of a, a hybrid between a plane and something like this, which is a draw knife. Very uh, old instrument, um, widely used for making things like chairs. This chair was made using uh, a lot of work, using a spoke shave and using um, a draw knife. You do the, the big, the rough work with the draw knife. And the earlier, earlier spoke shaves were pretty much either an adaptation of the draw knife made much smaller, where you have a, a low angle blade and, and a tang, couple of tangs that go up into a piece of wood. And, um, or one that looked pretty much like a plane. If you look, at a 
a modern spoke shave, you'll see in essence, it's a low angle plane. Okay? It's, it's got a very, very short sole and um, it's a low angle plane. And what you do is you use it for taking edges off. Maybe if you're, you're, you're forming a, 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 what are they called? Chair arms or something like that. You would use for rounding off the edges, for shaping the edges. It's almost in some ways like a carving tool. Um, but the draw knife is, is fairly heavy duty. Uh, are you able to point the camera? What I want to do before I move on to actual spoke shaves is point out a couple of things. When you very often you're working with something round with a spoke shave, and you never know what you're getting with something round because this has grain that's changing in direction as you go along the wood, and it also has grain that goes across like that. Um, I've marked the growth rings just or a couple of them just so it can be clear but what I want to show you is that as you work your way around something that is round like this the grain changes so you have to be aware of that all the time especially when using a draw knife or a spoke shape because it will change last night I played with this this line here shows me where the 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 differences on one side if I'm pushing the blade this way it's very rough on the other side if I'm pushing it this way it's very smooth and it happens to be right on what I call the crown at the point where if you think about it you've got grain across here and you've got these layers so it gets a little weaker here and the grain tends to flake out so you've got to be aware of that anytime you're using a spoke shave or uh, because you, you you'll be working with curves um, just be aware of the grain at all times. I mark this and I blithely thought, okay, well, if I go over the other side on the crown there, it'll be the same, but it's not. For some reason, it seems to, to uh, I'll, I'll show you. Hey, Paul? Yes. Um, you said a couple of things that make me jump to a conclusion. You said that you'll often be using the spoke shaves on curved surfaces, and you also talked about how you use the draw blade on uh, curves. And I'm just wondering, yes. is that the space wherein these tools are used is on non-planar surfaces? By and large, because a plane, which it originates, the word originates in the Latin for level, a plane works on a level surface. These guys are not meant to. That's why they have a, a very short sole. If you tried to plane, say, along the edge of a board with this, you're going to get something with waves in it because that sole is not going to keep the blade steady enough. Does that make any sense? It does. You're basically saying that the tool can't do plane surfaces, so you have to, by default, call its strength its weakness, and it can therefore do curved surfaces. Absolutely. <laughs> yes, you got it. So, yeah, the, now the draw knife is, first of all, it's a bad boy. It's very sharp. You, you don't want to um, mess with it too much. That I wouldn't do so much for curved surfaces, but it's great for shaving stuff off. Um, so, for example, well, these vices are not the most steady vice in the world. Okay, so if I come up this way, it takes a little getting to know these. That's actually cutting quite smoothly, like that, because I had my arrow pointing up this way. If I go, if I turn the blade around and start working, do you see the way it's split there? Or here, the way it's split? So I've got to be aware of my grain at all times. When you're using a draw knife, you use that sometimes, because you're often cutting down to make, for example, the the legs and arms of the chairs, I mean the legs and, yeah, the legs of the chair, um, you had to take a much larger piece of wood and cut it down and then steam bend it and so on. But if I take this, this that is splitting right there, right on the line, and I start cutting there, I get a nice smooth line. So just something to be aware of. You're always, if you want to learn about brain, Two, th two pieces of advice. Learn how to carve and use a spoke shape. 
I was very frustrated when in my early days with stone chips. So I have another, if there's time, I have another uh, interesting tool to show you, but I'm gonna move right on to spoke shapes. So I'm gonna give you a little tour of, of some of the spoke shapes that exist, not all by any means. And I'm going to, and then I'm gonna show you a little bit about how to sharpen it and a little bit about, um, how to use it. So basically your, your original spoke shape, let me find a nice, oops, uh, here. this one is fit. your basic modern spoke shape, as we mentioned before, is a tiny plane with a sole, just the same as a, um, as a, as a plane, but it's only just around the mouth. It's a very, very small distance and it has handles so that you can work it either on a slightly concave plane or a convex plane, um, wh whatever you need to, need to do. It, you, these are kind of fun because it's almost like carving. You, know, you can take a, you know, a table edge and start putting scallops into it and stuff like that without having to, to use a lot of sauce. So this is your basic, absolutely basic modern plane made in England. It's a Stanley. It is a Stanley 51. Um, I like them because the next plane, and the, the next one I'm going to show you has adjustments on it, but I personally prefer this one. This is my favorite probably of all, all my spoke shapes. This guy, same deal, nice flat surface there, blade coming through at a little, little lower than 45 there, but it has two knobs to adjust. These give you a, a somewhat of an advantage because you can easily change the, you know, whether you're doing a coarse cut or a fine cut by adjusting these two. On a plane, you have just one, but these two in and out. The other thing about this and what many, many people do with spoke shares is they'll have one side heavy and one side light. And I'll show you that in a, in a little while. So you can push one side heavy and then take, take the other side back and, um, and, and, and uh, get some good results that way. This I bought new several years ago. Um, I don't use it a whole lot, but I, in truth, I don't use my spoke shades a whole lot because it's not that often that I'm doing round stuff. But anyway, so there's one other kind of flat sold spoke shape. This is a slightly different kind. This is, again, it's flat sold. But the mouth, I mean, not the mouth, the area in front of the blade is adjustable. So with this, with a single knob, I can adjust from fine to coarse very, very easily. I don't move the blade. In this case, I move the mouth, which is Sorry. actually... What, what, yes. dimension, what, what direction is it moving when you twist that adjustment? It's moving up and down like okay. that. So the gap between the blade and that piece is widening or shrinking? Exactly. Okay. Yes. Yes. And one of the things that you will learn if, as if you try to use a spoke shape is they take a little bit more, a plane, there's a technique, you know, you get some weight onto it and you move it steadily and smoothly. These take a little bit more getting used to because you do have this very, very flat sole and you're often working on a curved surface. So you really have to kind of tune your focus to where the edge of that blade is and what it's doing. But we'll talk about a bit more about that later. So this is, um, this is an old favorite of woodworkers. This is so old it doesn't even have a number. <laughs> I can't remember what it is. So in the tra Stanley tradition, of course, everything has a number. So this is a 51. This is a 151 made by Stanley in the modern era. This is a 151A made in Germany. I, um, but this is, this is, that's another story. I'll get to that in a minute. Um, there are also low angle spoke shapes. I'll take this out in a minute. In fact, I'll take it out now. The low angle has a slightly different approach. This is actually more closely allied to a draw knife than to a plane. These guys are set up pretty much like a plane. But this guy, excuse my 
lack of visual here. How do you get it out without cutting yourself? Okay. So this has a little blade. Traditionally, they had a tang that you, you know, just a little bent up piece of, of, um, of, uh, of metal there. But these are threaded, which is really nice. It gives you some ability to adjust. And it's a tiny little three inch long blade. Is that a rust fill bit? This, no, this is a Paul Duffield. <laughs> I, uh, years ago, I took the art and class of plane making and I, I, I went in there with 10 planes and came out with a bunch of spoke shaves and about 25 planes. Um, so oh, I learned how to make that. They are probably, in terms of ease of making, one of the easiest tools in the, in the world to make. There, there's, there's, there's just... Uh, two perhaps three moving parts to them well there's no moving parts but there's a blade sorry there's a blade and the mouth i originally put lignum vitae in there but it wore out it quite literally wore out making those chairs and so i put in a brass one now and then i had to shape it because it needs to be slightly curved but the nice thing about this is i don't have to fiddle to set the uh to set it i just put it put the blade back in I tighten down my nuts, and then if I show you close up, right next to the nuts, you can see some little Allen screws. So if I want to adjust how deep the blade is, I can use those. And then once that's set, each time I take it out and sharpen it, I, uh, I just have to screw it back in again. But this is, compared to these guys, these are these are really nice, but this is this is like an instrument, and you really have to learn to play it, you know. But in terms of, of cutting end grain and so on, it's fantastic. I've got this one. I don't know if you can see. I'll try and show you. But I've got this one set up so the blade is slightly deeper on one side than it is on the other, mm -hmm. and that way. I can. I don't have to adjust it when I want to go from a coarse cut to a fine cut. So those those are the flat sold flat sold uh, um, spoke shaves. This is one of those ones that I think Stanley made just because they thought there might be a market for it, and they thought it was a neat idea. It's two spoke shaves in one. It's got. And it doesn't, it's, it, it, you actually just bolt this piece of iron in there to hold it in place or screw this piece of iron in place. But what it does have is a curved blade on one side that I've cleaned up and a regular blade on the other. I've got no use for that blade, so I've only bothered to clean this up. But for something like uh, a pole or whatever, I suppose there's some use to this. It's, it's interesting sharpening this blade. And then you have, the curve in a different direction. Do you guys see that? Okay, so the curve is here is on the bottom. So if you were going into a really deep curve there, you might use this. I personally, I've never managed to, this is one of those things I've just never got the hang of it. Um, I find that uh, if I need to, if I need to uh, work that deeper concave curve, I'll figure out another way to do it, usually with a bandsaw. Um, I've never actually had a situation where I could say this is the only tool I can use to use it, to do it with. But I do have a couple of them, and they're both made by a good German brand. Uh, if, you, if you see the Kunz brand, they, they, are, they are a fairly good quality product. Um, so that, that's a few of the spoke shaves that, that, are, that were available. Stanley made all kinds of different spoke shaves out there. Of course, they were originally made for spokes. The professions that used them the most were, were barrel makers and uh, carriage makers, um, both of whom used spoke shaves a great deal, hence the name spoke shave for making wheels. Um, so... Uh, the, the, and, and, you know, barrel makers are working with constant curves. If everything that they put together is on a compound curve, it seems. So, uh, you know, they're, they're interesting instruments. Um, 
there are times when they're really useful. I've, I really enjoyed using this guy. Once you get used to it, it's, it's just a pleasure to use. Um, but if I had to get rid of all of my spoke shaves and leave two, I'd just keep this really old little one without any fancy adjustments and my low level. And uh, that's pretty much um, what I have to sort of show off to you in terms of, of spoke shaves. I'll do a demo of them in a minute. Um, this is, looks like a spoke shave, but it isn't. It's a Stanley number 80, it's a cabinet scraper. We talked about scrapers a few weeks ago. And I discovered last night that we have two of these in the shop. I, I'm gonna um, get them into real good working shape. Um, but we've got two, they, they have their uses. Um, I wouldn't trust it if I were trying to do the final smoothing on a, on a cabinet, but for, for, for you know, taking uh, things like scraping, scraping my uh, bench, scrape, getting the glue off my bench and so on, they're great. But anyway, it looks like a spoke shape, but it isn't. Um, so uh, before we move on to an actual demo, are there any, uh, do you guys have any questions? Paul, was the angle of that shave, the scraper version, um, was it similar to the way we'd use it with our hands? You know, slightly off perpendicular, just, you know. Absolutely, 10, so 10 degrees? this is the way, it's, it's leaning forward. Okay. And then there's also, there's a little knob there so that you can adjust the tension in the blade. The difference, one of the differences is this is a 45 degree bevel. So you just sharpen up one edge because oh. it's, you know, you can't just flip it, flip it over, but it's of a high quality steel and um, it'll, it'll last a few minutes. It's relatively easy to sharpen. It's, it's, it's very similar to the, to the card sharpening method. Got it, thanks. That we, that we talked about a few weeks ago, but you just put that, that, that little uh, curl over on one side. Okay, thank you. Yeah, hey Paul, a question here. Yes. Um, I, I realize that you don't do this often, but can you actually find replacement blades for all these things? Uh, especially the older style or the more specialty spoke shades. Are there, are there blades available? I don't know of anybody that sells them new. Um, poking around through eBay, you see people selling all kinds of parts of all kinds of old equipment. Yeah. When they've got a broken old piece, they take it to pieces and then put it online for almost the price of the piece. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, so, it's, um, so you have to think about that a little bit when you... Uh... I, I would not... Not without, without its blade. Uh, it's pretty simple. Um, they're, 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 I can't really show you here, but they're just a fairly small blade, but every company has a different one. Um, but yeah, I wouldn't buy a shave unless it was complete. Neither would I buy a plane unless it was at least all there, you know, even if it's beat up and, and maybe needs replacing, at least I can see what the replacement piece needs to look like. Right. Okay. But, uh, but uh, yeah, if you, if you get stuck with stuff like that, uh, you know, give us a yell and uh, I'll see what we can find. Okay, thanks. All right, any other inquiries, questions, comments? Rotten Tomatoes? <laughs> no? Okay, well, I'm, I'm actually, I'm gonna, how we do, we're doing good on time. Um, I'm going to just, I'm not going to do any sharpening, but I'm going to show you how you sharpen a spoke shape. Basically, exactly the same way as, uh, let me just take this out. So this is actually one that I found here in the shop. And although it's a little bigger than my absolute simplicity one, it's, it's a nice old shave. I'm going to clean up the, the, the uh, sole here. Interesting to note, there are three slashes on the front and back of this. I think somebody just marked those slashes on there as, as, because they owned it. So this may actually have done a bit of work in its time. Um, the blade looks like that. This is how I found it a few days ago. 
So what I'm going to do is I'll simply polish up the blade on a stone much the same way as I do with the plank. Polish up the back, I'm sorry. So I'll take that to a nice polish and then I'll put it into this homemade device. Um, this is in that book that I showed a couple of years ago called Sharpening Waterstones. Um, but it's easy enough to make. He doesn't give any dimensions. He just puts a drawing in there. Um, what you basically do is you want it to be pointing down like that. So your bevel goes downwards from here. So I'll put my bevel in. And then the, he, he has a nice little brass knob and all that stuff in his drawing. I just found something that was in my... Uh, in my drawer of odd, odd bolts and stuff. Anyway, you, you put that in there. Now, this blade I found has, is, is way off square. If you, I don't know, it's too, too fine to show on the camera, but, but it's way off square. So whoever used this deliberately had it off square. So I've decided that I'm gonna sharpen it. If that doesn't work, then I'll, I'll sharpen it. Um, uh, you know, just the conventional way, I'll bring it back to square and then we'll take it from there. But this guy actually, I think, shaped, guy or woman, shaped the blade such that it's, it's off-center because it's not, not done accidentally. You can tell from the, from the uh, scratch patterns and so on. But in essence, what you do is you set it up much like you do uh, a honing guide there. Um, checking your angle. And then it's a fairly, it's not a, you're not usually a very thick blade. It doesn't take long to grind down if you do it at about 600. But it, getting that bevel angle there is, is and getting it square, uh, you make it a little smaller than the blade you're going to cut for so that you can check for square. But um, checking for square is relatively easy. You can either move it to one side and check it that way, or um, you can eyeball it. I like, I just play around until I find something that works, but, but uh, I only made this a few days ago, so I haven't used it much, but I'm gonna, I, I actually set that maybe off center. And then once I've got it in, in, in my little jig and it's set just right, we just go back and forth on your 600 or 120 or whatever you need to do with it until you've got a nice straight blade. And then you start going up through the grades, much the same as, as, uh, as, as with a, um, what you call it? a honing device. And then once you get up to your, you know, you've got a polish on the bevel and your back is polished, then you'll have to take it out and just get rid of that, um, I can never remember the, the name of it, the little wire piece that you, you, you get builds up right on the edge here. Um, so a burr. It's, you just need this little homemade device. That as far as, I'm sure you can spend $120 on some fancy device that'll, that'll do spoke shave blades, but this, this is, trust me, zero. Okay, so that's, that, that's that all jig? I'm gonna say about sharpening unless you have questions. Is that jig just made of wood? Absolutely, it's a piece of maple. Okay. Yeah. Actually, it's it's a it's an offcut from from cutting up from making a plane. I see. So, yeah, great. But and so it actually, it was two pieces of scrap maple. So I never actually paid any money for it, and uh, and I just glued them together to you know laminated them to make a, a number of things and and uh, um, yeah, piece of cake. You you shouldn't spend more than. Uh, you know, maybe, may, maybe if you have to go to Ace Hardware and buy a, a bolt, you know. <laughs> but uh, there's, there's, it, it, it is, any book you read, when it comes to spoke shapes, they say these blades are impossible to sharpen accurately by hand. And, and I'd agree with that. Any other sharpening questions? All righty. I will move on to a little demo here. So, Dallas, can we move the camera? Just a little around here. If you're making one of these, one of those chairs that I showed you earlier, one of the things is the rungs. 
let's see, you can just see the rungs there. You can see that they're not um, even cylinders. They're, they're, uh, they're um, tapered from the middle outwards, and then, of course, they're tapered again as they go into the chair. But um, the way that you make those is you basically create an octagon. This is obviously partially made. And uh, so using a spoke shave, you create the octagon here, remembering as you shave that this change of direction as well as, oh, I'm sorry, this change of direction on the curve here and these changes, this change here will lead to changes in the grain. So be, just be careful as, when you're getting to know the piece. You can use a pencil, you can use um, whatever you like to, um, to create that, um, you know, to create guides for you, little markers that tell you where the grain is going. So you start with a piece like this. Um, and you, you, I, I basically what I've done is I, I think you guys, oh, I'm, I'm still looking at the camera the wrong way. Here we go. Um, I marked, uh, there, that catches the light. I marked a circle and then I kind of marked out an octagon shape there on the end because I'm going from here in the middle to here. So I also mark where the center is and I will keep marking that as I make it. I'm not gonna take a lot of time to do it, but I'm just gonna show you the approach. All right, one reason that I like this little guy is because I can set it pretty fine. And, and when I set it on a very fine cut, it means that it's less likely to dig grain out. The finer the cut is, the less likely you are to dig the grain out if you go against the grain. And so I'll just try, see where it, see where it is. That really is set thin, you can see. That'll, that'll give me some really nice thin shaving. So I'm going to go over to something that's a little bit more. Okay, so my, 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 my coarse side is this side. So I'm going to start here. The reason I'm starting at the end is because I want to define that circle there at the end before I do anything else. Because um, once I cut through that circle, I no longer have what I'm aiming for. This is about five eighths. So anyway, so I, I being very careful, I'm just gonna see now that I don't you can't see, but it, it just started chewing out immediately. As soon as I hit there, it's it's chewing out. So that I know this side. I don't just take the edge, but I don't want to overdo it. Okay, so if that was nice and smooth going that way, this way, there's a good chance that it'll be smooth going the opposite way on this side. Nope. So it hasn't rolled over. You know, I'm starting this right at the beginning because I have a tendency to do this to a piece of wood. So I, I, I'm trying to train myself to always get the beginning starting correctly first. So, is that someone signing in or off? <laughs> yeah. See now right on the top there, it's really. So luckily I've got enough meat there. So now, I haven't got a pencil, but I now know that on this octagon, here anyway, or this face of the octagon, I want to be coming this way. On that face, I want to be coming that way. And on that face, I want to be coming that way. So basically what I'm going to do is work it down. Well, I marked it wrong. <laughs> work down to the circle, and then I'll start work, working back to my midline. So 
then I can start creating. And I can create the curve that I want. One trick that I do, especially if, even if I'm using a curve, but especially if I want to get a nice, oh, I'm looking at everything but the camera, if I want to get a nice even line from here to here, is I'll keep checking my, especially my first flat face, because I want to establish the first flat face, but I'll keep checking it against the ruler here so that I'm not getting too curvy or too deep or whatever. So what I've started to achieve here is, you can see I, I, I've begun to roll over the edges there. So I'll, oh, somehow that's become very, oh, there we go. There we go, that's a bit more visible. I will work my way around there to where till I've got an octagon on all sides. And then I can use something that cuts a little finer like this to, to make it round. So uh, that's how you fit a square peg in a round hole. Um, I'm, I'm, I, I would go into, you know, I demo more, but we're kind of uh, low on time. Um, so uh, having seen that very quick demo, did that bring up any questions about how and what to do? No. Oh, this okay. is like you're going to end up with a uh, constantly measuring. If you had um, three uh, spokes in the back of a rocking chair, or five, and you wanted them to be the same, I think I would go crazy trying to get them to be the right dimensions, one to the next to the next. If you get good at this, I suppose you just can pull that off. It becomes easier. Of course, it's much quicker to do it on a lathe. Yeah. Um, but the guys that designed, uh, you know, that the, the were using spoke chips often didn't have lathes or didn't or weren't necessarily making anything round. Um, you know, for example, this chair was it's an American chair um, from Appalachia, and and the people had fairly crude instruments in order with which to make it. But hey, Dallas, but, can uh, you change cameras, please, so we can see Paul? Sorry. We can't see you. We're looking at your hand. Oh, I'm sorry. We, I didn't move the camera. Yeah. Oh, great. Just a minute. I think that's, that'll do it. Yeah, there we go. Thank you. Sorry about that, folks. <laughs> All right. So where was I? Um, okay. You were, making a, you were making a good point about the difficulty, and we talked about lathes. That's all well and good for your front leg. But if you want to make a back leg and you're going to steam bend it, first of all, you need to have flat surfaces to hold it in the steam bender. And this curve is cut after you bend it. Very and it's a constantly changing curve. Yeah, excellent. And like there, you yep. can see, as this is all part of it, as you can see, an unfinished chair. But there are the, the, the slits for the slats. Um, but uh, yeah, so it, 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 it's, it's where you go off the symmetrical that the spoke shave and, the, and, and so on get really helpful. You know, like this piece, I think I, I'm, I'm, I'm just playing with it, seeing if, if I can get a, a curve that I like. And I, I think I can see something in there. Yeah, good examples. Thank you. All righty, do we have any other questions? It's a bit of a whistle stop tour today, but oh, I know, I wanted to very quickly show you one other item because we've got no, we haven't. I'll show you next time. No, you're good, do I? Okay, yeah, um, you have another 15 minutes. Okay, good. There's another real interesting info. Have any of you guys ever taken the Maloof chair class? Okay, Dallas has. Okay. You remember, Dallas, when you took that class, you, um, you used what was basically a, a, an angle grinder with a, with, was it a Holy Galahad or was it the chainsaw type? No, I used uh, just a, uh, uh, sandpaper, real rough, 36 grit sandpaper. Oh, right. Okay. So, so you used the, uh, um, 
you used, uh, but it was a power tool, power tool. Mm -hmm. but it's noisy and it's, mm -hmm. it's no, dusty mm -hmm. and, and doesn't, doesn't um, to me, doesn't induce the serenity that I want when I'm handcrafting a piece of furniture. But there's a little instrument that will do it. It's called a travisher. It has a curved blade. This one came from England from, and I'll put up the connection later on, the Windsor Workshop. This guy gives classes in England uh, um, on how to make Windsor chairs. Um, and this is a kit. He sells you the, a, a block of maple, basically, and the, the handmade blade, which was made by an English craftsman. Note that it's got a hollow grinder. <laughs> um, but it's a curved, curved blade specifically made for this purpose. It has the tangs that, uh, that I was talking about instead of a, a threads. So I have a, we, you have Alan, wrench, Alan screws in there holding the, holding the blade in place. But once you've got this baby sharpened and set up just right, again with a, a curve on that area in front of the blade, um, it's an incredibly easy piece of Okay, I just got the extension cord out and got my angle grinder and I'm just about to fit the Holy Galahad. Let's see what you're doing. Can you lower the camera? Yes. Lower the camera. Right. We can't see what you're doing. Oh, I'm, oh. I'm, I'm looking. <laughs> Oh gosh, we uh, we've got a long way till we catch up with NBC, haven't we? <laughs> All right, so here it is. I already started. You've heard the sound of things, but here here is how easy it is. No sand, no sandpaper, no sawdust. I don't know if you like that noise, I love it. I love the sound of metal shearing through wood. But it's like cutting butter. There's no effort to it whatsoever. And uh, I, uh, I used it I, the, a few years ago in Fine Woodworker. They, they, the, there was a German guy uh, put in a design for a stool there. And uh, I made the stool and bought the travisher to do it. Um, but it, it's 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 a really neat piece of equipment. Costs about eighty bucks. For me. And uh, and you can buy it in a kit or you can buy it complete. I believe that they use them in the chair making thing at design in wood, don't they? They use a slightly different design, but I find this just really fits nicely. And because you get it as a kit, you can shape it to whatever you want. And you also have a choice whether you want to exhaust the uh, the chips out the back or out the side because you just drill the holes differently, out the back or the top rather. Um, but uh, yeah, lovely little piece of equipment. All righty, okay. Any questions about travishers? All right, okay. Uh, I am. I wanted to have a little bit of a discussion, but I think we're going to run out of time. Um, but what I wanted to, a couple of things I want to, um, wait a minute, I'm missing something here. No, nope, no. Nope. Okay. Um, I, the Krenoff plane thing, I, I, I was talking with, with Travis about it, and we were, we, we were wondering if perhaps it's, it, it, it might be all by itself too much of a project for many of you guys. I don't know. What do you guys think? Paul, could you repeat the issue? I didn't hear it. Could you, do you have one well, there to show? You could just show them what, to remind them what that uh, particular plane was if, in case they missed that session. Do you have one there? Uh, I don't have one with me. No, a Krenoff plane is, is a design of plane, actually. It's rooted in European 
planes, but it's a, an easy plane to make oneself. And in the forum, I think there's a couple of, uh, of connections to, to uh, articles about them. Um, but I put it forward a few weeks ago. I, 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 quit, I asked whether people were interested in making one or making several or whatever they wanted. There was a, an expression of interest and, and before sort of trying to develop any further plans, I wanted to check that, that A, that there is an interest in, uh, in doing these planes and B, perhaps we could help you along the way to making one, um, you know, without actually having to come into a classroom and, 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 uh, um, and, and well, do it here. I just put up a search page with results on Krenov planes so that people can see and be reminded of what it is you're talking about. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Paul, so I'm interested. Good. Yes. So there's a yes from me as well. So there's at least two. That's good enough for me. <laughs> um, so my question would be, uh, I, I've been making them at home uh, by hand, but largely, you know, by cutting the faces with a bandsaw and then planing them. But um, a lot of you guys have have uh, saw stops or, or, or table saws at home, which makes it really easy. But what, what, how, how could we, I'm, you know, I'm just throwing this out. I've got a couple of ideas, but and Travis had a very good idea. Um, but how could we make it easier for you to do this? Well, at the time when we were discussing, the notion of a kit came up. Yeah. Yeah, I think having the, the blade already, having the, the, the basic materials, the blade and the material. Some people may want to choose the different types of, of woods. Yeah, yeah, so it, it just depends. Yeah, because the blade and the chip breaker cost about 50 bucks. Uh -huh, yeah. um, but if a group of us wanted to, to get together, we could at least save ourselves some shipping money by ordering them and finding a way to distribute them. Um, Paul, if you were to put this up as a notion on the forums and we were putting a link in the chat right now, people could be directed to the hand tools SIG forum and then they could maybe weigh in if they'd like to uh, that would be great. join in or add comments. I'll put the link up for people now. Right, yeah, I keep meaning to sit down and get working on, on putting some stuff up on the forum. What I'd like to do is probably in the future put something up ahead of the presentation <laughs> yeah yeah paul hawk uh, sells the kit with or without the the iron so if you already have the iron you can buy their kit uh, for the wood plane otherwise uh, you can buy them both together i've done their quick kits too yeah did you find it good yeah it was excellent yeah so that's another way to go yeah. um personally there's su such a simple piece of equipment that the biggest challenge for me is making a pin and i've figured out a way to do that with hand tools that works pretty much every time. Um, but even in when I did, took the plane making class, we were having issues with, because they had a jig and we're using a drill press and all that stuff. And there, there were some issues with that, but that is the most technically demanding um, thing. So, um, could, I, could I ask whoever had the, the, the purchasable kit, if they could drop that into the chat, that'd be useful for us also to know about. I don't remember who made the comment, but. Well, I've done it and yeah. somebody's yeah. already Yeah, I think it. Hot Tools, Highland Woodworking have it. Incidentally, somebody, I think it was Doug, asked a question about, um, about uh, whether you can buy the, the um, totes and so on, and knobs for handles, and I think Highland Woodworking so. Um, well, Doug will be here in a few minutes. Yeah. Oh, great, well, we'll ask him when he comes. Okay, if you have no more questions, I'm gonna talk about what we're gonna look at next week. Three I got three minutes, perfect. So, any of you guys ever had a challenge with dowels? Either getting them, you know, you want, you, you, you're doing a, 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 a lovely piece of walnut and you really think that a piece of holly dowel would be really good in that. Well, good luck getting it. I think you probably got to get on the internet and um, and uh, go ahead, go ahead and, and look around and buy it and wait for it to come. However, when the shop is open, we have a tool here that uh, is one of our hand tools that 
Yeah, let's get down onto the, the deck here because I'm it's prettier than I. So I just made a few the other day to give an example. But the nice thing about this tool is it'll it will um, you can make it out of whatever you want. Um, I made these out of coca bola. There was a bit of a stretch because it's not very strong, but I made these little guys. This is um, Bubinga, Sapelli, Red Oak, Cherry, and wonderful thing about this tool is you can put grooves in as well. So um, you've got all those compressed fibers that will will expand when you put glue in there. Now I was using this, I'm gonna put this tool up here. Using the tool the other night, or just trying to get, you know, get used to it and work it. You basically, you bolt it to your bench and you work away at it. How to use it will be the subject, one of the subjects for next week's presentation. That but, was a beautiful tease, Paul. <laughs> sorry? It was a beautiful tease. <laughs> tease. Teasing the subject. Yeah. <laughs> but um, when I first, uh, if I've got one minute, um, when I first uh, saw this machine, somebody had it out and they said, look what somebody gave us. And there was just this mangled piece of wood in here. And they said, it's useless. It doesn't, do, it doesn't work. Well, the wood was about, it was longer than six inches. You can't make dowels longer than six inches, but how often do you really need a dowel six inches? You're usually sawing it off a three foot piece, but, but um, you don't often need it uh, that's longer than six inches. And the other thing that, at first, I, when, I, when I used it, I thought, boy, this is really, really rough. And um, I realized that, the, dowel, the edge of the dowel doesn't have to be smooth. Actually, in some ways, it's better if it's rough because you get more a better key for the glue. So I am finished. Thank you guys for tuning in or looking in and um, really appreciate you uh, spending your Saturday mornings with us. Thank oh, you, Paul. Just, just, uh, just a quick note. That yes. dowel maker was donated to us by Dick Ugaritz. Dick who? Ugaritz. Oh, right. Great. Yeah, well, and, credit to him. It's an amazing piece of equipment. And he's been, uh, yeah, it was done way early. Uh, two years ago it was given to hey, us. Pete, we've got to end the session. I know. We're done. I'm, I just wanted to make that comment.